stacking them deep, selling them cheap. That tastes like gasoline, rubber, and victory. We're just out here stacking packs. All right, ladies and gentlemen, joining us in studio, one of my good friends. He is on his book release world tour, carved out some time in between late night shows with Jimmy Fallon, Sirius X7. <laughs> he is coming in to stack some pains with us. Marty Smith, author of Sideline CEO. Thank you, sir. Thank and, you. And never settle. It is. Uh, it, this is a long time coming. It We've is. been trying to put this together for a long time, and I appreciate your spirit so much. Corey and I have been buddies for a long time. During COVID, we tried to solve all the world's problems by on mountain bikes. running around on mountain bikes all over North Carolina, and I about killed myself three or four times. And Corey got tired of <laughs> pick, taking out his spatula and picking me up <laughs> off the dirt because I broke another shoulder. But uh, but it's so great. I'm, I'm so grateful to be here, and thank I, you all for the platform. I feel like um, every time we did hang out, you were get the one getting hurt. We wrecked. <laughs> you wrecked on the, the mountain bike. You yep. tried to move a pine tree. Uh, it did not move. Your shoulder did. Then you come play kickball with us, Worst and you make life. you make you you moss the entire uh, <laughs> playing field. Your you boy die for a, you Who? die for a catch, and then you b broke a rib, right? I broke a. So what happened was, okay. So I was playing third base. This was two years ago. Was this hot, two? The hot corner. Two years yeah, ago. Twenty one. Uh, in Corey's charity kickball tournament, and I'm standing at third, and I am cheated way way up. Like the third base is back and to my right. Blaney steps up and just boots one down the third baseline. And it's curving foul, and I dive. And I had told myself on the way in the door, I even looked at Kurt Bush and I said, Dude, don't leg out any singles. Don't <laughs> dive. Don't, we're old. Don't, don't be here. Just don't do anything. And lo and behold, the competitiveness took over. I dive. My shoulder drives straight in the ground, separated my shoulder, broke my collarbone. It was awful. I mean, it was just – and I turned – what was funny is you guys came – Blaney came yes. running over. He's like, ah! I was like, don't bleep and touch me. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was as white as a sheet. Yeah. And I knew I was hurt. I just didn't know how hurt. And then I was fine. I kept playing. And then Almirola shook my hand after the game, and I just heard it go, pow! And I was like, that's it. It's over. You so, stood up madder than a snake. Like, yeah. damn it. Like, that was the look on your – I remember watching it like it was yesterday. You stood up like – it was that exact look. I told myself I wasn't going to do this, and, and I right. did it, and I'm mad at myself. Yeah, I was so furious at myself because that was the entire intent going in. Support your friend. Have a blast with your buddies. Talk some trash. Don't get hurt. Mm -hmm. And I – turned into kickball so, takes well over. you, you checked all you checked two out of three boxes unfortunately <laughs> what i love about it marty it's like a bunch of old dudes thinking they're athletes yes it is and it's isn't it such a joy thing like everyone does like a silent auction a dinner <laughs> a golf tournament not Corey. no he's out there just breaking necks kicking talking bombs smack. yeah it's talking an awesome it's event best. i mean you guys do such a good job and is it in kannapolis again yeah, yeah. all right it's so today as this, this drops oh okay okay it's tonight great Corey's recruiting me um, I do appreciate that every single year he makes a jersey for me. Look at this. Just in case I get a wild hair. I know you're a busy man. And decide that uh, I'm going to come back out. He retired. Yeah. No, we always need a third base coach. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah. Some year I might come back. But uh, tonight, as we sit here, I am going to take my wife to see Chris Stapleton in Charlottesville, Virginia. Oh. So I love you, but I don't love you that much. I don't blame you. <laughs> I don't blame you. Now, next year when when we sign up, you're going you're gonna to know a lot more about leading your troops into battle after writing this here book that sits in front of a sideline CEO. I mean, you've got any greatest of all time coach, whether it's college football, basketball, Doc Rivers. Uh, I it's mean, a who's who. It is a uh, who's who. It, it was an interesting project because, I mean, all three of you guys have been around elite leadership. Y'all been around Joe Gibbs. He's in the book. I interviewed Christian Horner, who, of course, is the Red Bull Formula One How's team he? principal. Oh. He's amazing. He's super intense. And with, you know, ESPN, uh, McGee and I, Ryan McGee, those of you. Shout out. May or may not know my, my brother from another. ESPN sends us to the Formula One races now because ESPN broadcasts them. And it's interesting to be around those guys. It's a very different vibe than our garage in NASCAR. How much, so? How so? Much stricter. I mean, it's a whole lot – more strict is way. there actually wine and cheese or is that just no no wine and cheese <laughs> but oh, okay. when we were in miami in may jimmy butler 
This kind of blew my mind. Jimmy Butler. Is that hairdo he's wearing actually a thing? I'm not sure. Jesus. Um, it really does have a lot of uh, Looks uh, like outcast vibes, doesn't <laughs> it? It does. Oh, I like my. the braids a lot. I hope he brings those. I don't back. like that Karen haircut he's got. Yeah. Keep, keep, it, keep it moving. I was blown away. Well, this is a whole other aside, but I was blown away with like how sinewy that guy is. He's like thinner than I thought he would be. Anyway, right beside McGee and my set at the Formula One race in Miami, he has a coffee called Big Face, I think, is what it's called, Big Face Coffee. And he's infatuated with coffee, all these different coffees from all around the world. And he was sitting there selling his own coffee at the Formula One race. And I'm like, that's Jimmy Butler. Wow, pretty crazy. But With a coffee stand? With a coffee stand. A trailer. Hustle. He rolled a trailer in there. <laughs> and we need to look that up, somebody, in production, please. I think it's Big Face. And I think it's called Big Face because money has big faces on it. Mm. Is why mm. I think he named it that, but nonetheless, uh, so you guys have all been around, been around great leaders for quite some time and covered them or worked for them, in your case with Rick Hendricks certainly. Um, I wanted to put together a collaboration of great minds and great leaders because the number one motivation for doing it was I had so many people in my path who injected self confidence into my life and brought me with them, especially when I didn't believe I was capable of doing it myself. Leadership is not power. Leadership is influence. So through trust of your words and follow through with your actions, do you have that influence that will bring people with you, especially when they don't believe they're capable themselves? And, I mean, it's Nick Saban, Dabo Sweeney, Mac Brown, Tom Izzo, Roy Williams, Doc Rivers, Urban Meyer. It is a who's who of championship leaders and and minds and influence and so I'm grateful to all of them they gave me time they didn't have and I think it's an amazing text that no matter your walk you don't it's not a sports book at all it's a life book and I'm grateful for having had the opportunity to do it Marty's wearing a 28 Davy Allison shirt my guy your boy my boy Larry Mack roll tide yeah he's RTR He's got Saban and a big painting above the fireplace. <laughs> um, so I'm I wish she was joking. Cliff Daniels is now right next to him, by the way. It's Saban. And it's it's now, Cliff okay, Daniels. explain Mano. that. Why does Cliff Daniels garner that uh, position? He's, he thinks the sun rises and sets, really. Uh, and Cliff, Cliff yeah. yeah. He, he thinks his leadership, there's been a couple moments on the racetrack, the Coke 600 last year comes to mind when everything falls apart and the, the, the famous motivational speech at the halfway point, we've wrecked, we've been out of this, we've literally been on fire, but we are still running and we can get back in this and I, almost came back and I won the race. I bet you Larry Mack was like and on it, the edge of his seat. Like I mean, it, I bet it, he was, it, it, like it got him yeah. fired up. Yeah, and I think after that and just like the winning, the dominance, the 10 win season, I mean, all of it. He just feels like right now he's the new Chad Knauss or Ray Evernham or Dale Inman. I mean, he just puts him on, on a shelf, on a pedestal that, that big. When he was working with Johnson, um, I think it was before he ascended to the crew chief of that car. I think he was either a lead engineer on that car or maybe yeah, a was. car chief on that car. And we used to ride bikes a lot. And I would be around Cliff just with Jimmy, and I really was taken with his presence. There are certain people who have a very distinct presence that demand that you pay attention to them, and he has that. It's a self-confidence that isn't cocky, and it really is striking. Now, I love you, son. He is a world-class crew chief, but when you got a generation of wheel man, that helps a little bit too. No doubt. Yeah. And they are, they are definitely uh, a wonderful collaboration. They get each other. They obviously communicate at an elite level, and that's what it takes. And they're super different, right? Yep. They're like yin and yang, and that's what Kyle needs probably. And Cliff probably needs the opposite because if, if your driver was, in, it was as bought in as Cliff, Cliff, I think there would be probably more distractions than anything because Cliff is like, hell, Cliff introduced my wife. I've known him since we were 15. And the first time I met Cliff Daniels was at Southside Speedway, and he's a Ryan, this is my legend car. I, I rebuilt the whole steering column to have no slop in it. And I said, like, what a freaking nerd. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was the first time I ever met him. And, yeah, he, him and him and Tiff ended up um, introducing me to my wife. So thanks to them for our time in the 14 car. But, yeah, Cliff has continually made every team he's ever been on better. And he's one of the guys that got the shot and is, you know, excelling. Well, one of the most important things in my mind uh, to be an elite crew chief is the willingness to delegate. And that's part of this book. 
Kirby Smart is Georgia's head coach. They've won consecutive national championships. And he said to me in the book, he was like, look, I was a micromanager. And micromanagement so often comes from insecurity. But when I finally learned to delegate, that's when I became a championship caliber leader. And I think about Canals. Yeah. Like, Canals was the king of micromanagement. And it was so hard on that team for so long. And then – they, you know, he, he was really fortunate to have Jimmy. Of course, Jimmy was fortunate to have him. They're the greatest union of all time. Sorry, Richard and Dale, but uh, that's just my opinion. No, but that's when, fact. That's when, I mean, when you have when you have those polar opposite personalities, you're so right. They can blossom that way because what Jimmy had to, what Jimmy took a lot of a lot of BS behind the wheel of that car, and but it was for the greater good and they won a lot of races as a result and you know chad another thing in the book is the evolution chad was willing to evolve through yeah. it and man like it, it was so fascinating to watch that evolution as they went through their dominance man you talked to so many obviously premier coaches in terms of their leadership abilities in in the book but you've also got to talk to some of the greatest athletes of all time christian Otto ronaldo I watched an interview that you did with Tiger Woods at Augusta, right? I mean, the list of guys you've talked to is is super long. Is there a common thread that personalities and everybody's kind of mannerisms and demeanors are different, but there's got to be something that's a common element that makes the great ones great and separated from the good ones? Um, there is, and I think it's that – so I, I would – I just learned this when I did this project. I, I think that there is the willingness to work hard. I think there is the understanding and the acumen of how to do whatever your chosen path is. But what I look like, like Nick Saban said something to me in the book that I will carry with me the rest of my days, and that is mediocre people don't like high achievers, and high achievers don't like mediocre people. Mm. And if you think about what that means, this is what it means. People who are uber-driven, undaunted, unwilling to compromise, devoted, dedicated to a degree that those who aren't cannot fathom, they don't have time for those people who can't fathom it. They don't have time for someone who isn't willing to live on that frequency. And those who aren't willing to live on that frequency are oftentimes intimidated. So what do they do? They tear down. I'm about to run Preach. the Let's go. Wall. They, Preach. They, Let's go. Preach. What they do. Go, baby, go. It's so true. What ends up happening is when you're around someone who is indomitable and that intimidation sets in and you go, I'm not willing to reach that. So let me just go, let me disparage you because you got that inside you. Yeah. Let me try to tear your heart out. Uh-uh. You can't touch those people. And the Tiger would I'm infatuated with Goggins, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, those guys that would cut your heart out. And eat it. And, and to, to, to be the absolute greatest. Yeah. And so much sacrifice comes with that. I was going to ask you, what's the balance? Well, there, for, for a lot of those guys, the balance was, if not impossible, uh -huh. extremely difficult. Hell, it's hard for me. Like, I try very hard to be a present, attentive, uh, attent attentive husband and father. It is my number one goal. My, my, I don't want my legacy to be any of this. I want my legacy for my kids to go, man, my dad was awesome. Yep. Yeah. My dad demanded of us, but he followed through with the vulnerability and the transparency to be relatable on our level because that's what great leaders do. No two people assume information, process information the same way. So you have to reach them where they are. Yeah. 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 And so you got to bring people with you. Have and that's to. that's got to be hard when you're just at another level. Dude, and that's a hard balance. Yeah. Right? I read a quote the other day, right? That's not contrary to this point, but it said the only people in 20 years that are going to remember that you worked late are your children. And I was like, mm. oh. damn. All right. Let me tell you something that really stopped me in my tracks. I think it was 2012. It was around that time, the latter couple of years of the ESPN broadcast partnership with NASCAR. I was exhausted. I was in Loudoun, New Hampshire for the chase race. And it was like 830 at night on a Saturday. And I was laying in my hotel bed watching a documentary. I think it was about Buzz Aldrin. It was about one of the famous astronauts that went to the moon. And he was asked, do you, what would you love to do over? 
what regret do you have in your life? He said, I have but one. I wish I spent more time with my children. And, man, I was in the middle of that 20 straight week run where you're gone five days a week and your wife's a single mom and you're trying to manage all that stuff. And God bless the the spouses at home who are trying to manage three kids at once with no help. And you just go, the hell am I doing this for? Yeah. 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 What am I doing this for? Can we lighten the load a little bit? And so – Can we – Yeah. No, your time – that's when you do a time audit, right? Like, okay, what's worth my time? What am I saying – yes and no to too much like we talk about that often but like there's also a, a price to being a high achiever no right question. so you have to know who's paying the price if it's your kids maybe you have to adjust man i think know, there's that. there are seasons to reap and there's season to harvest right yes. you, can, you can freaking work till the sun comes up and goes down but you also have to be intentional to know when the scales are getting tipped the wrong direction and it was, you know that was what one thing that was so interesting in our household about what during the covid lockdown I'd never been home in my adult life. I'd never been home for any appreciable time. Same for all three of you. And so Lainey and I were very intentional about our time with one another and our time with our children during that moment where I wasn't running to an airport. But it was so funny because about two – NASCAR was the first sport back, and they sent me to Darlington, and they sent me to Pocono and Talladega in these RVs, right? But I started to get a little bit twitchy, like, dude, what if sports don't come back? Okay, how am I going to provide? What am I going to do? I need to control my controllables, and that is what came from that time. The yeah. book. The yep. book. That book. Really? Oh, yeah. That. That's when, did, when, when you did, started the book. Yep. Yeah. That's when I started it. I interviewed Mac Brown first, the head football coach of the University of North Carolina, who's like my dad. And I called him, and 53 minutes later, I'd gone to a master class in leadership, in trust, in crisis management, all the interesting pillars or principles that are in the book. Two days later, I called Urban Meyer, and I went, this thing's undeniable. And so I started wow. down that road. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about Saban. That's where I was going with the Larry Mack pick. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. We've no, gone around the world no, since then. No, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. We're no, going to go again. We're going to um, go again. But I think when I spend time in Boston, like Belichick, I think was intimidating. We can all relate to maybe a smoke interview yep. being intimidating. Um, how do you fight that barrier just as a reporter, the intimidation factor, when you know they put a wall up and really don't want to answer questions and you have to bring a smart question to get a smart response? Um, and also maybe the biggest principle that, that you got out of Nick. They're all cut from the exact same stone. If you – Prepare. I think excellence lives at the intersection of preparedness and passion. So if you prove to the – like it's funny that you use Stuart. People have asked me so many times, aren't, weren't you intimidated by Nick Saban? Isn't he intimidating Tiger Woods? I went to Dale Earnhardt Tony Stewart Media School. And if you don't show up prepared and show them that you have – genuine care for their time they're going to reciprocate what you give them if you show up prepared you ask them intelligent thoughtful open-ended questions that let them share their truth they're going to reciprocate that with their truth if you show up half-ass unprepared they're going to give you what you give them all of them they're all the same that way and from the second I started with coach Saban almost 10 years ago now That has always been my mission. I've never once interviewed him where I didn't feel like I was as optimally prepared as I could possibly be. And he's been good to me. I mean, in all all honesty, he has been great to me because he can be a tough nugget. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like he hadn't hollered at me, said some choice things because he has. Really? But I don't care. Off camera? It's never never personal. Um, Off, yeah. It's never it's never personal. Yeah. Is it about certain things about your opinion of his team? Nope. Or? Okay. It is it is when I did not like I, I went one question too many. Mm. Oh. Mm. Yep. When On you, the scheduled time length. Yep, it goes back to time. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I wanna I wanna rewind it back a little bit because right before we sat down and started talking uh, we got introduced to a kid named Alex. Shout out, Alex. First day at NASCAR. First day, Alex. Yeah, Alex. Don't know where he came from. He was dressed really nice. He was. He's ready. You told him a story about your first day at NASCAR. So intimidating. How – so how, what was that experience like? First time just in a new sport. 
And also, did you ever envision going from that first day at NASCAR to being college game day? No. no was right it with books. ESPN or where it was the first? No, this was with NASCAR. Oh, okay. So my first job out of college, I worked at a newspaper. I'm a writer. I f the TV thing just kind of happened organically, for lack of a better term. You've but got the hair for it. That's hair. Why. Yeah. All about the hair. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was writing for a, a newspaper right out of college. You guys ever met Paul Brooks? You guys remember Paul no. Brooks? So Paul used to be a vice president here at NASCAR, and he was from the town in which I was working. And NASCAR was my beat. I was a local reporter that covered NASCAR racing. I would do Martinsville, Richmond, Charlotte, and Bristol. Those were the races I got to attend. And so I got a call one day from this lady. Hey, my son just got promoted to vice president of NASCAR. You want to do a story on him? Hell yeah. Give me his number. So I called Paul, did a story. That was that. Several months later, this box shows up on my desk, and it was 50th anniversary. This tells you how long 98. ago it is. Today wow. is, or this year is the 75th. That was yep. the 50th. And it was all like the desk furniture, the little business card holder, the, the marble thing with the pins <laughs> inside, you know. And I was like, I won the lottery because that job paid me like 12 8 Yeah. Yeah. So oh. <laughs> long story short, there was a piece of stationery in the bottom of the box. I immediately went over, emailed Paul, and said, get me out of here. I got bigger aspirations than this. I'll come to Daytona. I'll scrub the toilets. I'll, do, I'll, be, I'll be your runner. You give me a chance, man, you're not going to regret it. He wrote me back. I get it. We don't have anything right now. If we do, I'll let you know. A couple months after that, I got a call to come to Charlotte and an interview. Someone had left NASCAR online, which at the time, the NASCAR's Internet site was like four years old at the time. I came down here young and green as – to be and for whatever reason they chose to hire me and my very first race was Sonoma California and I was sharing with these guys before we started that I remember walking into the garage area and being so intimidated because everybody knew everybody and they were saying what's up and they were telling them about this happened this week man can you believe that happened last week I think we got a piece this week man that guy this I'm like I'm how I was so intimidated to the point where I'm like I just don't know if I'm ever gonna ever going to make it here and yeah. you know there was grown men used to race them cars back in the day too late 90s i mean you walk into the garage <laughs> not anymore we got kids yeah i, I mean it was biggie it was rusty wallace dale it jerry was ricky rudd dj uh daryl waltrip Ru like like i mean it gordon icon yeah just like dudes mm -hmm. oh. tony stewart came in that year he was a rookie in 99 and so I mean, it was just wild me, to me. And they were just household names and just these titans. And that was the heyday of the Gordon Earnhardt rivalry. And the sport had a rocket ship strapped to its ass. Yeah. And it was just a wild time to be in it and be so young. And, and I was fortunate to make great relationships with Junior and Jimmy Johnson and Kenseth and Sadler and all them boys. Well, that was like the next wave. But well, how, did those, how did those legends treat you? Like a kid. Um, it was, it was, and I, you know, I think about myself now, you know, in my mid forties, how would I look at a young person who was obviously just so young and doesn't know a th thing? Like, I mean, I, they got me with the long weight joke. Y'all remember the long yeah. weight? Where'd they send yep. you for a long All weight? over the damn garage. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, Earl Barman was oh, one of the, the, oh my God, one oh. of the chief instigators there, but Can we, one of the just, for, just for the listeners. Because I don't want any of our Stack of Pains listeners to be fooled by the long wait. Tell them what, what a long wait is. So, I, this is what happened to me. I've sent plenty of kids on long waits. Girl. I just got told to walk all around the garage. And, they, you know, you, they, they're like, hey, go to the 17 truck. Yeah. And, and get a long wait and bring it back. So I go to the 17 truck and they get. And you, you think know, this thing is going to like yeah, make I'm some like, speed. Yeah, I'm like, man, okay. Yeah. What? <laughs> it's not a short one. It's a long I'm one. on a covert mission. <laughs> right. <here laughs> for a long wait. <laughs> I mean, it must have been 20 teams. I oh walked all God. over that garage from and one they, side. Yeah. No, everybody knows. They're like, go no, see no, we took the it, three. We, we no. took it last week. Okay. We took it over to the three. Yeah. I'm not walking up to the three truck and, and asking they, anything. <laughs> well, and they give you a name. Like, hey, yeah. go see Banjo. <laughs> exactly. 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 So like, I need Banjo. Yeah. And they're like, what's up, kid? Oh, he's in <laughs> And they're on it. Right? <laughs> so so I'm standing outside of 
So <laughs> uh, inevitably, it hits you that you are waiting on a long W-A-I-T yep, yep. and not a W-E-I-G-H-T, yep. and you feel like a dip. You feel Holy like a complete boogity. idiot. <laughs> but it was funny, man, because – one of the greatest blessings for me when I first started was that I worked for NASCAR. So I had to keep the same schedule the officials did. Oh. I had to be there when it opened, and I had to stay till it closed. And that was demanded of me. And because of that, you know, you come in, and it's like, it's Hoss Berry. It's like these old school dudes. Gary uh -huh. Nelson was the director of the sport. And Mike Helton was the president who's the most intimidating damn dude in the history of man. Yet a teddy bear. And yet the yeah, coolest guy ever. No doubt. Um, but it was, that was very beneficial to me because they all saw that I was willing to put in that same time that they did and drink bush lights with John Darby a lot. Love that. Speaking of, speaking of drinking some bush lattes, well, you drank – um, a, a famous beer on the front stretch, Pit Road, right after Dale Jr.'s last race. You had a good story uh, for the listeners so, for that one. So th for those of you who may not have seen it before, so Junior and I go back. Um, he was one of the first people I met in the sport. I admire him beyond words. I think that his willingness to race after his father's death is the reason that there's still a NASCAR because – Every single individual in the sport, whether that was the sanctioning body administration itself, every sponsor, every other driver, his own team, Richard Childress, everybody looked right at him to determine whether the sport was going to race in Rockingham, North Carolina. And he chose to race, so everyone raced. And he gets frustrated sometimes with me for saying that because he's like, no, man, you know, everybody said it's a but, great Dale jr but yeah, yeah, uh, i've been practicing for yeah. a long time <laughs> but it's the truth and he had so much grace in the aftermath of that but anyway i just kind of watched him the whole way through and when he finished in 2017 he pulls down pit road at homestead miami speedway and you got to remember too he just made his way through the darkness in that point of the concussion aftermath. And he was damn sure that I'm going to go out my way. I'm not going to have some doctor tell me when I'm done. I'm going to decide. And so he had decided, okay, I'm going to be done with this. And that moment where he parks his car on pit road in Miami and all of his guys are sitting on it, they're all firing back beers. And I just went over to interview him for, for Scott Van Pelt's show, uh, on the sports center, uh, show. And, when we got done, I just told him, man, I love you. And he goes, I love you too, man. You're one of the greatest people in my life. He's like, what are we going to do now? And I just said, we're going to drink one of them damn beers. Throw me one of them damn beers. <laughs> and Greg Ives, God love him, chucks one across the car. I, I, and Junior and I fire it back. One of the coolest moments ever for me. Well, Van Pelt and those guys, I mean, it was live. Yeah. It was on TV. So fast forward to the next March. I'm getting ready to interview Tiger Woods. So I'm sitting at Medalist Golf Club down in Florida, and I've prepared this interview, and I've got it down to 10 important questions. I've got 20 minutes. i got it to 10 questions that I think he'll at least respect. So this shadow washes across the doorway at the Medalist Golf Club, and I look up, and it's Tiger Woods, and I'm like, whoa. So I stand up, and I stick my hand out to shake his hand, and he's like, nah, bro, bring it in. He gives me this big hug. I'm like, man, it's so cool to meet you. I've been a fan for a long time. He goes, you want to know the coolest damn thing I've ever seen on ESPN? And I said, what? He goes, when you shotgunned that beer with Dale Earnhardt Jr. on pit road at Homestead Speedway. That is badass. And so I'm like, well, you go, you go win the damn Masters. I'll be waiting on you at 18. <laughs> <laughs> Two years later, he won the freaking Masters again, which nobody believed, and I still haven't yeah. had that beer with him. Someday, Tiger. But I'm sure he's watching. Isn't that cool, though, that – like, Scott and Tiger are – like, Van Pelt – so, Tiger watches his show all, every day. And I just thought that was so cool that it was resonant to someone like that to have that kind of moment. And I just – like, that was – it was such a diffusing moment for me with any anxiety or pressure yeah. I felt yeah. for that interview. So, that was really cool of him to do. I yeah. wanted to ask you about how you – because I'll be jealous. A lot of us were jealous of you in that era because – it helped that you were on the mothership, but you were friends with Dale. You're tight with Jimmy. Like, you were in the club, and you got a lot of stuff that the rest of us did not get. Yep. And I'm, like, 
10 years behind trying to find my way. I think as a female, it's probably a little different because if I'm hanging out with a bunch of drivers late at night, it's taken very differently than if you are. Yeah, sure. Um, so I kind of had to walk a straight path in that and I was pretty strategic, but you're around these guys long enough and you become friends and it is a family, but yet as a journalist, there should be separation of church and state. So how did you walk that line? The very first question I got asked when ESPN called me in March of 2006 was, uh, will you move to Bristol, Connecticut? I said no. The second question they asked me was, we hear from all the people that were asked. They were putting together their kind of ancillary programming group, you know, for the NASCAR Now show that we had for the uh, Sports Center stuff. Are you willing to report news stories? on the people that you have befriended. Yeah, I think, I think so. Well, it wasn't damn 10 minutes later. My very first day at ESPN was September something or other of 2006. My very first race was Homestead, Miami, the last race of the year. And then if you remember, Jimmy Johnson's first championship was that year. About a week later, he broke his wrist acting like an idiot, surfing on top of a golf cart. Whose golf tournament was that? Um, I don't think might have been his. I don't know if they were playing in a golf tournament or not. I don't remember if they were just playing or it was a tournament. Either way, that puts you in a. I reported spot. it right. It's my job. Yeah. Yeah. And it was an interesting aftermath to that because he was furious at me. I mean, absolutely livid at me. He didn't think it was a story. He's like, dude, it doesn't matter. I'm on my own time. I'm not missing any of this. I'm not doing that. And I'm like, I get it. But I had to report it. It's a new story. And someday when you're going to wake up and you're going to go, you know what? He was right. And I wasn't. And so we didn't talk for a while. Really? No. And there's a whole other addendum to the story. He was supposed to race in this race of champions thing. He couldn't do it. Blah, 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 blah. But ultimately it made our friendship that much closer because he had tremendous respect for me and the journalistic side of my life. And, yeah, I mean, I, I, that, that thing was tested immediately. What about with Dale? Um, Cause you guys were real close yeah, oh and, yeah. and there were ups and downs to his career. How did yeah, you I, navigate that? Um, I think that, well, I was very honest. I was never, I never really couched it where, I mean, that, that 2000, nine era where he would be in press conferences yes. with his chin on his chest and wouldn't say anything and was so low and so depressed and so down because he felt like he was letting so many people down every single day. Um, I would text him all the time and I would say, get your chin off your chest. You're, you're, you're the face of an organization and you, you're going to get on, out to the other side of this. You have got, like Dale is someone who needs affirmation, just like I am. I'm a lot less like that now. When I was younger, I yearned for affirmation, and that's what really built my self confidence. Dale is that way, and especially in that era of his career as a racer, pre Steve Letart, if he felt like his team didn't believe, he would fold. And he had a few people in his life that would build him up, myself included, but. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd go on TV saying they were a disappointment every Sunday. You did? Oh, yeah. They were. I don't think it's talked about enough of just the mental battle with a driver in particular, right? Because you feel like you are the quarterback, and you're a good day you can hold the team up, and a bad day you can let the team down. And there are so many expectations, particularly when your dad right, died doing the sport like Dale did. I could see how it could weigh on you. In your opinion of just athletes, whether it's Tiger Woods, whether it's college football players or NFL players, where do the great ones get that internal self-confidence and belief? I don't know. I wonder if they're born with it. Like if it's just innate. Like I what think it's makes, learned. You do? Yeah. See, I think you're born with it. I don't. Is that a learned trait? Like is Michael Jordan – you feel like psychologically it's learned, but physically it has to be God-given. Uh, what's, some... what's interesting, so th there's – in the book, uh, Mac Brown said to me that in 2008 he went to the front lines of the war and he spent time with uh, General Raymond Odierno. And they were right there on the front lines and he asked General Odierno, are leaders born or are leaders made? And he said they're made 
why do you think we have academies? Why do you think we have, uh, you know, the, the, the classes in the schools? And I'm sort of on the fence about that one. I think that you can learn to hone something that, you, is, that burns within you to be different. And in the book, too, I hate to keep going back to it, but that's, that's, what, uh, that's what we're talking about. Roy Williams tells a great story in there about MJ about how Michael Jordan told him on the first day he was at the University of North Carolina, I'm, I want to be the greatest Tar Heel ever. And Roy looked at him and said, well, then, son, you got a lot of work to do because you ain't close. And he's like, what? I, I work just as hard as anybody else. And he goes, you don't know how to work. He said, I work just as hard as everybody else. And he said, exactly. Yeah. If you want to be the greatest of all time, son, you got to outwork everybody who's ever lived. Well, two days later, they, were, they had just finished this workout for their preseason camp. And Michael asked Coach Williams to stay behind in practice and said, Coach, I heard what you said. You're never going to meet anybody for the rest of your life who works harder than I'm going to work for the rest of my life. And to the day he stopped playing, nobody ever outworked Michael Jordan. Yeah, and he did it. Yeah, I mean, it made an impact because they started him as a freshman well, that, and won a national championship. Ended, yeah. So ended up being pretty good sound. I mean, yeah. we, when I keep going down that path, I mean, there's a plaque outside of the swamp. Tim Tebow said in that press conference after they took the that. promise yeah. speech. We were just talking about it. The last weekend was the anniversary of it. Yeah. Um, that, guy's, that guy's amazing. Wrote um, the foreword for the book. He did. A great friend. Somebody, Corey's idol. Yeah. My guy. He sent me a signed uh, jersey. I gave him a helmet at Daytona or Bristol. Awesome. Yeah. He's a wonderful man. Uh, I've learned a lot from him. He told me something a few years ago. I was in a unique sort of period four or five years ago where I felt like I had a good idea where my career was going and I felt like I had a very obvious bullseye to get there in terms of the path. And then the the chessboard that is our careers, there were pieces played I didn't anticipate and that wound up not working for me. And I was down about it. Tim and I went out to the USS Carl Vinson to spend a few days on the aircraft carrier with the sailors for our Veterans Day feature uh, show that we do on ESPN. And he and I were choppering off the deck of this aircraft carrier, and I was very quiet and because I was just in my own head a little bit. And he's like, what's going on with you, dude? I'm like, nothing. So we get on this plane to leave the San Diego airport to fly to San Antonio, and I'm quiet. And he sits up in his chair. He goes, what's going on with you, dude? I was like, I don't know, Timmy. I'm just in a headspace where I feel like other people are defining my path. And he pointed right at my face, and he goes, nobody else defines your life. They don't have that right. Only you have that right. Don't let anybody else have that place in your heart and your soul. And it really did. It was such an emotional and mental shift for me, just those very few words. Mm -hmm. And I'm forever grateful to him for that. He's an, I'm, I'm so grateful I get to spend every weekend with that guy because I learn from him every time. Mm. There is a fork. Perhaps you can explain it if it was what it looked like. When ESPN did not renew the NASCAR contract, were you already like – destined to go were you already pointing in the direction of college football because I kind of looked at it like I did not you were too strong of a writer and a broadcasting talent I had no question that they were going to let you go but in my head I'm thinking but Marty's ours like this is who he this is what he does like Fox or NBC has to pick him up like we can't do this sport without Marty here and then like you just ESPN took you off down this different road did it it was an, what was that like? It was a unique time um, because I just, you know, I'd been in the garage at that time for 16-something years, I think. And um, I love the sport to this second. I watched the entire race uh, on Sunday at Talladega. And I pay very close attention to the sport. I keep very close – uh, in touch with these guys that, that, you know, it wasn't just that era that I'm – Chase Ellis like my little brother. YRB's like my little brother. He's like my little brother. Bubba's like my little brother. I, I care deeply for these guys. DH is trying to get me to play pickleball tonight. So, I just – I care deeply about it. But I made the decision that I was going to stay at ESPN and just kind of see where it took me because I wanted some diversity in my – 
life and, and path. And I feel like complacency is the greatest threat to excellence. And at, in that period, um, I felt like I needed to be challenged a little bit. Yeah. And so I thought that they would – I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know I was going to do college football. I got home from Homestead, Florida, November 17th, 2014, and I walked in my front door, and Lainey had been a single mom for 20 weeks. I had eight, five, and two at home. God. And I walked in the door and put down my bags, and I was like, honey, I'm home. Everything's harmonious. And she had tears in her eyes, and she said, I need you home, Martin. You got, I need you home. Oh, she and used Martin. Too. I said, no, she, she, there's three she people who can Martin me, and she's one of them. <laughs> and so I was like, don't, don't worry. Um, I'm home for the next six weeks. My new contract with ESPN wasn't supposed to start till January 1. Sit down on my couch. She took our eight year old at the time and five year old to school. My two year old was playing in the floor. Open up my phone. Very first emails from a gentleman named Lee Fitting. He was the executive producer of College Game Day at the time. He said, your passion belongs in college football. Mm -hmm. Start studying because I'm going to embed you with one of the four teams that qualify for the inaugural college football playoff. And I couldn't believe my eyes. And I'm like, how am I going to do this to my wife? Because I saw that email as a treasure map. I knew that if I was willing to follow its direction and dig deep enough within myself, I would find riches beyond my wildest dreams. And I ain't talking about money. I'm talking about life experience for her, for me, for them. And she was not happy, not even a little bit happy. Did you wait a couple days? No, I did it right then. Oh, man. I did it right then because – and she'll tell you to this day she had no say in the matter, and no matter how conceited – or egotistical or self-centered it may sound she's right i knew it was an unbelievable opportunity and going all the way back to your point danielle they dropped me in columbus ohio like an alien from mars i got ohio state the biggest fan base in the united states of america (laughs) and there's a hilarious addendum to that story i went all the way through that playoff with them they won the national title it was joey bosa ezekiel elliott Michael Thomas, Devin Smith, Raekwon McMillan, Darren Lee. They had pros everywhere. Taylor Decker was their left tackle. 60% of that roster was pros, and I was with them. And fast forward a whole year, Clemson was playing Alabama in Phoenix, Arizona, and Urban Meyer was one of our guest uh, guest analysts for college game day at the National Championship. He walks over to me, and he goes, I got to talk to you, man. He goes, I can see you're thrashing on your reporting when you're done, I'm going to be sitting right over there. I need to talk to you. And I'm like, oh, I can do it now. He's like, no, when you're done. So I get done. It's like I did my last report. It's eight minutes to kick off. I walk in this workroom, and I take a knee beside him like I'm in the huddle or for some reason. <laughs> Just felt right. Super duper weird. I don't know what I was thinking. But I take a knee. He's sitting at a couch like this, so I'm sitting right here. Easily could have just sat down beside him. You're humble. Him. Yeah, show respect. And he goes, I've been – meaning to tell you this for a year. Okay, he goes, you remember when we met? I said, yes, sir, I do. He goes, can I tell you what I was thinking? I said, sure. He goes, Florida State gets Tom Rinaldi. Alabama gets Kaylee Hartung. Oregon gets Samantha Ponder. And they send us this redneck from NASCAR. (laughs) That's what they think of us. And I didn't know whether to laugh, cry, be pissed. Is it an insult yeah. or a compliment? Yeah, what, like yeah. What? Yeah. yeah, thank you. And he started grinning. And he goes, but I want you to know something, son. It took me three days. And I said, three days for what? He said, it took me three days to realize that you were the perfect guy for my team. And I said, well, could I ask why? He said, I saw the way my kids gravitated to what you were asking them and what you said to them and how you seemed to care about them on a human level. And and beyond that, you were an underdog. Nobody believed we belonged in that college football playoff and we won it all. Nobody believed you belonged there either. And you damn sure won it too. And I just thought that was so cool of him to say, to take the time to share. And that's one reason he's in the – I mean, people have different opinions of Urban. After everything that happened in Jacksonville, 
and all that, and that's for you to decide. Criticism of how Jacksonville went is totally fair. But I judge every person in this life on their own merit, and he's been awesome to me. Well, it took Urban Meyer three days to figure out if you liked it or not. i got three questions for you because you <laughs> are a special Stack and Pennies guest. Are you ready? Ready. I ask everybody this. We asked Kurt Busch these questions last week, and everybody else has been on the in the studio. They have gotten a chance to answer these. The question for a driver is, if you had to pick one car and one track the rest of your life, what do you go with? I'll ask you that question. Then I'll also pick, if you had to interview one person, alive or dead, mm -hmm. uh, at one location, okay. where do you where do you, who do you pick? And then one car, one track. All right. One car, one track for me. I want like that 2005, twisted two, up. 2006, gnarled ass, twisted up. That was the coolest era ever for me. And that was also when Charlotte had all those bumps coming down the back straight away. And it just looked so kick ass at night. With the reflective With, numbers there, too. Oh, yeah, oh, dude. Yeah. And there was so much travel in the springs oh, and the me. suspension back then. It just looked badass, man. Hell yeah. So that's what I want. Okay, that's my car and track. At Charlotte too? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, not my favorite track, but that's the one I would want all in right. that area. Like think about, I know this is going back like 10, 10, 12 years. Think about how dope one hot night was. Oh, yeah. Like, they ain't no cool. It's the coolest race ever, except when Junior won Daytona in 01. That was the coolest. That was the greatest moment in NASCAR history. Different, like, right? Like, they're, they're like that. Different. Yeah, different emotions. Yeah. One hot night was baller, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Davey waking up in the hospital. Did we win? Did we win? Hell like, yeah. I asked the car chief <laughs> on that car is our car chief. No uh, Now, yeah, Raymond, Ray, Ray, Raymond Fox. He's our car chief now. And I asked him, I said, what'd you guys do? He said, went to tech. <laughs> <laughs> like just typical old yeah. school racer i'm like you guys didn't go to victory lane he's like no they want us to robert said no we just went to tech tore down went home i was like damn cash out check i mean that, like think about that race though man Big E, right it's coming down the back straight away and i mean it's just like the coolest thing those three guys too and kyle having the opportunity to win it dumping davy and oh mm. my god i could go on and on and on cool oh, he, he dumped did davy dump dale no i think kyle did i think so too yeah, he was just a wrecking ball. We'll have to go too. to the tape, but I, I don't blame him. It's the Winston. <laughs> hey, going for the wreck, mama. For the it don't Dude, matter no. who's in the way. No, no. way that twenty no, hit that. the first fence. night race too. Yep, but one hot night. Yeah. And there's right. a story that Dale was going off into turn one, and he got in the radio. He's like, "There's a light bulb out right there past <laughs> the yellow camper." You know, That's like very Dale. And I'm like, I believe it. Very Dale. One person interview in one location. All right, um, I'm gonna say Michael Jordan. At the Grove. Um, I, I've i been around him a little Present bit. Present day? Right now. Okay. Um, I have been around the, him a little bit socially. Tell people what the Grove is. It's his golf course down yeah. in Jupiter, Florida. Um, because I think he would be relaxed in that environment, have a little bit of his uh, tequila, tequila that he ha has, yeah. maybe a cigar, and the – flyest pair of J's you ever saw in your <laughs> life. Um, I actually one time stepped on MJ's Air Jordan, <gasps> and I wanted to die. It's it like he's got yeah, I don't him. know if he's got any more. Most yeah. embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, it, Marty. I think yeah, he's got it, a couple more, though. I lose my mind when people step on mine. Yes, because you don't have an endless amount in your closet. Yeah, but hey, still, you know, dude. Them. It's Michael Jordan's <laughs> yeah. Air Jordan. Like you, and he yeah. had on – Danielle, this is going to make it even worse. He was wearing the M and M three. There's like seven pairs of those in existence. Mm. I'm Marty. so sorry. I'm so sorry, MJ. What did he but say? How did that go for you? He <laughs> sat back in his chair. Like I was like, oh my god. Like I, I was getting ready to. I was like, gonna scrub say, it. yeah. Did you kneel and Urban like, Meyer style? And yeah. He was like, dude. He's like, yeah. <laughs> he leaned back in his chair. He's like, there's more where that came from. <gasps> yeah. So he was, he was cool very graceful. It. Very graceful. Wow. Okay, that's a great answer. Question number two. What is the most embarrassed you've ever been? Oh my gosh. Um, the most embarrassed on the, I've, on the job. On the job. The most embarrassed I've ever been on the job. I thought it was going to be 2007, Flag Football League when I ripped your shorts off. You can't. You came across. It, you you were playing quarterback for the second Joe Gibbs. Gibbs. Team. Now, that was when we met, right? That was the first time we met. You didn't realize that you, <laughs> you were took coming his pants up against off the best. First time you met the man. Guess pass the the it's best pass date. rusher in yeah. the league. No, so the, so. <laughs> Let me tell you my story. I was on this team for Roush. NASCAR had a flag football league that we played off Harris Boulevard. 
and everybody was in it. Gibbs had teams, Red Bull, Roush, every Hendrick had two teams. J.D. Gibbs played quarterback for the other Gibbs team. Who was the st- – no, this was the same team. It was the same team. We only had one team. He just wasn't there that day. Okay, you played quarterback, and I – the whole our whole Roush team ended up being the one tire changers full Mount Pleasant football team that he just graduated with, right? So like I they were like, Yeah, you can't touch the ball. So in spite, I'm like, all right, they only let me rush the quarterback. I am gonna be the best f-ing quarterback rusher <laughs> in this. Of all like, time. I mean, almost got in a fist fight with Joey from from Gibbs, God rest his soul, remember Big Joey? And like I was just as brash as you could be. But yeah, I went to go pull your flag. And my hand got stuck in his pocket. And I ripped his shorts off. <laughs> well, I, I, there's one other thing I remember <laughs> about that when when we met one another. I had thrown a touchdown pass the previous drive or something, and I mean that was listen that league was full of dude like there were dude, great athletes all over that league, and I was talking a bunch of no. like no, and then the Don't next and then the, when when it was the same drive I think that. Ryan pulled my shorts off, but I was running to my right. You may remember this. And he was rushing me, and I threw this laser off my back foot, but it wound up being like eight or ten yards short of the receiver. And it felt uh, true as hell coming off my hand. So I'm telling him there's another one. And it felt like and dude, he – I didn't hear the end of that one until the end of the game. I mean, like he would not shut up. Yeah. But those were fun days, man. That like was. they were – That was a, those were fun days. It was a different time in the garage then, but, yeah, that was – well, I can only imagine the, between two elite talkers. Well, it really was. <laughs> it, it, it was a different era of the sport. It was. Back then. And I don't know why. I don't know what the difference was. I think it was we were the younger pups maybe still. and It was before social media too, so everybody wasn't as connected, right? You were, it was your guys and their guys. Like now everybody, I feel like we've all been friends in the garage. We're like, we all know what's going on with each other, our kids, because we're so connected on social media. I think that might have had a little bit something to do with it because it was truly like I didn't know like Aaron Kuhn, right, from – he was a Hendrick at the time, and I'm like, I want to tackle that guy. Yeah. Like I like there was just guys that got on your nerve because you didn't know them, so it was easier for them to be like the enemy. But, it, yeah, it was just a different time. I think we all did more together then too, it seemed like. Well, I think another thing that I feel like uh, – this is a bit of a – I digress, tangent, but – I feel like these days we're less connected personally because we're Correct. more connected virtually. Yep. And therefore, we don't take time for one another like we once did. And I hate that. I hate I everything about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a whole other podcast. We'll have you back in for to break that <laughs> down. Last question. So if I've got the old Men in Black memory eraser pen here and zap them all the way, all, every single career memory that you've had, NASCAR, college football, golf, the works you had to keep one what do you keep standing at the 19th green uh, the 18th green in 2019 at augusta national golf club tiger woods chips up and actually let me back up i'm probably 10 rows above the 18th green clubhouse is behind me tiger tees off tees off right He's walking up the 18th. There are probably 10,000 people all the way down 18, creeping over nine, all the way down one, chanting, Tiger, Tiger. It was unhinged in a way Augusta National is never unhinged. Even the guys that placed the placards in the scoreboard were clapping for him as he walked up the 18th. He chips up ultimately two putts to win his fifth green jacket coming back from that back fusion surgery and literally writing a miracle. And he walks off the green and his son Charlie runs into his arms and we were all instantly whisked to 1997 when he ran into his own father's arms. And as a group they walked to the clubhouse for him to sign his card and I am on my tiptoes feverishly writing every detail I can write because I have been charged by my boss with going out there and detailing this moment and walking to the nearest camera at the first fairway so I can tell everything I saw to the world 
the whole world, mm-hmm. and I get tugged on my sleeve, my right jacket suit sleeve. And I look over, and it's a guy who's like, Marty, I need, a, I need a minute. And I'm like, hey, man, how you doing? I'm still writing, watching Justin Thomas and Brooks Kepka and Tony Finau and Rory McIlroy all there to embrace their hero because he's why they play the game. Mm. And this guy goes, Marty, I need a minute. And I look at him, and I'm like this. And he, I said, hey, man, what you got? He goes, we're Clemson campus ministers. I'm like, oh, I love that place. I'm there all the time. He goes, we see ourselves in Tiger's victory. And I said, how? He said, we're all capable of huge mistakes in this life, but we're also all afforded the opportunity at redemption. Mm. And I just sat there for a minute and I said, you have no idea how easy you just made my life. Yeah. yeah. And I shook his hand, <laughs> yeah. and I ran to that first fairway camera, and I told that exact story yeah. to the whole world. Gave you gold right there. And in terms of my professional life, that's probably – there's several, but that's probably the one. I would say 1A would to be uh, to go back to Daytona in July of 2001 and watch Junior win that race again. Um it's the greatest moment in the history of the sport. And to see his it. joy. We had, nobody had seen him overwhelmed with joy and fulfilled in six months. And so that was a beautiful thing to witness. Mm. This is a beautiful interview, too. Gosh, thank you so much. I know you're a busy, man. You got to roll real quick. Where can people go check out this book and go buy it? Everywhere. Please do. Again, thank all of you guys so much for giving me the platform. Sideline C, you can get it anywhere. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million. Go find it, please. Again, it's not a sports text. It, it truly is something that you can take and envelop into your daily walk, no matter your profession. I've done that as a husband and father as well. And it's really process over outcome is the, the number one thing. We tend to project, and I don't want to project for my children. I don't. I want to be there for them in every step of their walk so they can find the best version of themselves and then they can make their own path. And I struggle with that sometimes. So you can get all of that there, and I hope that you do. Thank you, guys. I hope you do, too. That's Marty Smith right here in Studio Stacking Pennies, guys. Thanks, Thank friend. you, brother. Love you. Appreciate you. Thank, Thank you, you both. This is great.